Thanks for coming. Thanks for the bringing your energy post lunch. I hope everybody had coffee, chocolate covered espresso beans, what have you. Um, we uh, we're going to try to put ourselves in the in in your place in the audience and try to uh, shed some insight on what's happening on the various platforms that are available nationally and internationally um, to uh, to broadcasters networks trying to build applications to reach reach customers on a variety of different screens. So we'll take a little pulse of the. Uh, of, of, of the audience here. Um, how many people have a Roku at home? How many people have an Apple TV? Yeah. How many people have more than one um, specialized device other than a cable set-top box for, for delivering video? Yeah. How many people pay for a non-cable subscription? How many people still pay for a cable or satellite subscription? Almost everybody. Great. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of duplication. How many people buy a la carte media through um, one of their boxes that they use? So you guys are doing pretty much everything. Um, and, uh, and all of you still have cable and satellite. So from a consumer perspective, it's very confusing, right? Uh, I don't know. In our household, it's, uh, it's, we want to watch Homeland. Which input, which device, how do we get to, get to that program? From a publisher's perspective, I think it's even more complicated. Which platforms, uh, which business models, um, what types of relationships to address, and then within that, um, in a world of fixed resources, how do you prioritize your, your budgets? How are you going to measure success? across all these different platforms. And so that's what we're hoping to address a little bit today, um, thinking not just in the US, but internationally as well, where there's some really interesting things happening. So we're going to go down the row, uh, do some brief introductions, and we've got some fun, fun uh, questions to get the conversation rolling. So Ryan. Uh, my name is Ryan Holmes. I'm the director of digital media at BYU Broadcasting. Uh, we operate several television stations and radio stations in the United States and abroad. Um, BYU TV is our cable station. It's available in about 70 million U.S. households. And for the last almost five years, I've been at BYU TV building out a digital platform that includes apps on web, iOS, Roku, Xbox 360, uh, Android, Xbox One, Windows, tablets and phones, and, and uh, Amazon Fire. Oh, and Chromecast. <laughs> so we're trying to go to a lot of places. And uh, this, this issue of deciding which apps to build and in what order uh, is something we've wrestled with for the last four years. Great. Ziba? Ziba Kaboli, Director of Content Acquisition at Roku. Roku is... Uh, as many of you know, one of the most popular media streaming players in the market. We just hit the 10 million devices sold mark in the US, and we are available in other territories as well, um, US, UK, Ireland, and Canada. And I work with our content partners to onboard their channels on to Roku. And uh, I, I do think the debate is over. You should definitely start with Roku if you're debating where to start. <laughs> That's great. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm from Norway. Um, I represent NRK, the National Norwegian Broadcaster Public Service. Um, and I also um, work with the hybrid television, HBB TV, and that's a new platform. It hasn't reached the US yet, but it's big in Europe. I don't know if you want to run the video, but sure. I can explain shortly what it is. Um, so the video's running. Yeah, good. Uh, this is... Oh, it's a major evolution. <laughs> <laughs> this is the video from uh, France Television. Uh, it was launched there in 2011, so this video is from that time. Uh, it provided a lot, of, a lot of new opportunities for them. Uh, it was already big in uh, Germany, and what's actually unique is the thing mentioned here. Uh, it's a mix of broadcast and broadband, where you actually make hybrid services. So you announce uh, relevant content to what's currently on here let's say a uh, cooking program or whatever you call it, you can sh show the recipes, uh, TV guides related to what you are watching right now, so you can find similar content. Of course, news, uh, sports news as well. Um, and uh, more interesting, uh, the regional part, where you can make regional content uh, with relevance to your area uh, in terms of traffic, uh, weather, weather and stuff like that. 
Uh, and you also have broadband only services uh, like catch up video on demand, as you can see here. And uh, tons of other things. Uh, you can, of course, uh, reach the social media uh, part as you can with any other uh, device today. Uh, but I think the most interesting thing is actually the related part, so that you will get the announcement on the TV channel uh, of related web content. Yeah. And, uh, I mentioned this from 2011, just want to get into that later, but uh, the last uh, part here was actually about uh, voting, and I think that will be on second screen devices, and that's something we are developing currently. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you, Eric. Brian? Yeah, my name is Brian Jaquit from Sling Media. We uh, manufacture and sell the Sling Box that uh, we would say brings more value to your cable satellite subscription and actually uh, allows you to watch your pay TV content in more places on more devices. Um, we we kind of come at this from a little bit of a unique perspective because we make apps across uh, the most popular mobile platforms from iOS to Android, Kindle, uh, uh, Surface uh, tablets, obviously PCs and Macs. But we also now make apps um, on very popular platforms like Roku and Chromecast. And so we allow our uh, customers to be able to, to connect their living room TV to a secondary TV, either in another room in the house, uh, through a Roku, or through a Chromecast, or through an Apple TV, or in a remote location. So we're kind of doing um, software development, uh, obviously across all the major mobile platforms, but also working very, very closely to be um, you know, a, a partner to a Roku or to uh, the Chromecast customer to enable our customers to watch their TV on more TVs in more places. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm Eric Elia. I lead a software design and development studio called Kincaid. We build uh, mobile tablet smart TV applications for companies like Comcast on down to startups. Um, previously, I uh, spent a lot of time at this conference as part of uh, the Brightcove team in my past life. Um, so let's, let's get into it and, and go down. You talked a little bit about, about your companies um, and your organizations. Um, you know, what, uh, you know, if you had to, if, you know, there are certain platforms that perform better, let's say, from a publisher perspective for different sorts of content. Um, and, you know, within, within your different organizations, you know, would you say, could we generalize that linear traditional broadcast content works better in certain kinds of contexts? versus new original programmers um, that may not have traditional distribution? I'll take that. I think uh, it, it really depends. I mean, you certainly see the most popular OTT services like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon. They have a combination of new original content, but I think the, the popular content that does really well is uh, the streaming, you know, binge viewing of episodes, uh, current season episodes. Um, so I, I do think that they, they do need to rely on some of the original network fare. Um, and if you're just going out with just original content, it'll, be, it'll take some time to build an audience. Um, I do think that some partners that have come to us and have, have a combination of both linear live as well as on-demand content, they see the best, the most success uh, on their on their platforms, and when well, they don't limit Thank you themselves, very much for that. <laughs> well, they don't really <laughs> limit themselves. And uh, we have some some partners like BYU um, and others. We we always recommend our partners to develop both a linear live stream as well as on demand. Um, some other partners that have done it really well um, are Vivo, for example. When you <clears throat> enter the Vivo. Uh, channel and you launch it, you are automatically given three choices as a user to get into the, the, the live feed or the on-demand browsing or search. And so it gives you this sign of life. I do, we also think it's, it's a nice transition from behavioral shifts, watching linear and you're browsing your guide and you don't really have a choice, just go into midstream or whatever is airing on your TV. And when you're shifting into the streaming device, it's nice to have that mix. You know, I could just have that lean back experience or go in and find the content mm -hmm. that I want to watch. And with linear, in Vivo's case, there's no linear per se because they don't have a traditional That's network. True. So is it kind of a pseudo linear stream? It's pseudo linear. Okay. And it's really stitched together. Yeah. And, you know, you have a 
a mix of content that they're displaying on their desktop and iOS and other apps and taking it to Roku. But um, I guess a better example of that would be CBS Digital. They just launched a digital news service and updated their, their app on Roku a couple weeks ago. And so when you select CBS News, you go in and you launch the channel, it takes you directly to the live linear feed. And you can hit the back button and browse and see trailing VOD or some other stories from 60 Minutes or across a multitude of, of content. Great. Great. Let's talk about live, like true live, and, and maybe open it up to everybody. Um, what sorts of live programming, is, is, maybe even rephrase that, is there anything beyond sports that people want to watch other than that, that needs to be live? Yeah, Brian. I will take that. Um, well, actually, one of the things that, that I think is, is really fascinating um, around social media uh, with, you know, and we're talking about, you know, Ziba's talking about binge watching of shows and things like that, but, but social media has really made the prime time viewing of content, not for everyone, but for a, a growing population of, uh, of, of consumers, um, you know, that must see TV element that it maybe wasn't when, when DVRs became popular, when the Netflixes and, and Amazon Instant Videos became popular, where, you know, it wasn't a matter of like, you know, hey, Watch it when everyone else is watching. You know, you just watch it whenever you want to watch it. It's, uh, it's you know, it's great in that regard. But I think social has kind of brought it back into that that realm for the Sunday night, you know, episodes of Mad Men or Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad, where if you're not in front of the big screen TV and you're not able to be in front of the big screen TV, you want to be able to watch it when everyone else is watching it, or you want to watch it, um, you know, in front of the big screen TV. And is that going to be through a linear, you know, pay TV subscription, or is that going to be you know, are you going to be able to basically follow along with uh, the HBO Go app and, and, you know, when True Detective, bro you know, broke HBO and, and when Game of Thrones broke HBO, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to actually follow along and be able to participate and, and, and be a part of the conversation. I think that, you know, we've always traditionally been associated with sports and that's the, you know, Sling was great for sports. It was great for live live content. Um, yeah, but I, had I think some that, of those statistics you would. Yeah, share. I mean, I think that that you know, the fascinating part of that that first one, Eric. If you go back one, that says 7.23 hours a week are actually watched on the big screen. That's through that's through things like partnering, uh, you know, a Slingbox with a a Roku or a Slingbox with a Chromecast or a Slingbox with an Apple TV. People want to watch live content. But they don't always have a cable box in every every room. They don't always have a, a cable box maybe in a, a secondary home or a, a vacation home or a ski house. But they really want to watch in that lean back mode and watch yeah. it on the big screen TV. Yeah, I mean, let's let's talk about that further for a minute. What platforms are most popular for Slingbox in well, terms of app adoption? Yeah, and, I mean, app, and doc usage. app adoption uh, is is iOS uh, predominantly. Um, iOS uh, Android phone is very popular. Android tablet, not as much as, as phone. Uh, but iPad and iPhone are very, very popular. We've done a lot on the iPad app to integrate social and integrate discovery and recommendations into um, the actual app itself. So now you, you, know, you open up the app and you can see you know, very, you know, very visual like Netflix. You can see you know, this is everything that's on right now. It's you know, based on some Twitter recommendations. You can filter by sports. You can filter by movies. You can filter by all these different things. So we've we've made this a, mu a much more rich experience, and you can start something just by simply tapping on it, and uh, and and then you, you know you, it'll it'll either go on or it'll change the channel to that show mm -hmm. itself. You can also put in some social hooks there. Um, popular still is PC and Mac apps, uh, you know, across those <coughs> devices. But I think that the growing popularity of streaming devices and the ease of use of which you can actually send live content to those devices um, is, is made those platforms very, very popular as well. Interesting. No one's talked yet about, um, and I remember at conferences like this two or three years ago, uh, connected TVs or traditional consumer electronics companies building smart functionality in their TVs was all the rage and that's all everybody talked about. Those conversations seem to have subsided. I was at a dinner last night. We were talking about this sort of topic with people from sports networks, what have you. It was the first time someone's mentioned Panasonic to me in eons, and uh, it was a very vibrant platform for them. I mean, Eric, maybe you know, to, to turn over to you for a second, um, when you look internationally, kind of what, what are the most popular platforms, 
and maybe talk about kind of how standards are, are influencing that one way or another. Yeah, sure. If you could run one of the slides, uh, first one. Sure. That one, yeah. Thanks. Um, actually, uh, the reason why I came here was to present HPB TV. I think uh, it's being uh, considered by ATSC. Uh, 3.0 is uh, considering the HPB TV version 2.0. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But they are considering bringing this uh, into the US market. As for ter terrestrial initially, but uh, also it should be considered, I guess, for cable. Um, but as you can see on the map, uh, it's quite big in Central Europe already. Um, the, the reason why it's big is basically because Germany uh, started in 2001 and they had this uh, university that was able to really implement it in the proper way. Uh, so when they launched it, it really worked. And they had the experience, bad experience, I would say, with MHP. Uh, you use parts of uh, MHP how, in the US, GEM. But, how large in, uh, in numbers is the uh, it's 20, uh, 27, uh, sorry, 38 million households in Germany. And uh, per household, uh, I think it's 2.3 people. So it's- And are, are programmers able to deliver not just kind of the interactive linear content, but um, uh, video originating from other sources as well? Yeah, they do. Uh, I guess the main point uh, for uh, the audience in Germany was that you were able to announce relevant content to what you're watching right now on mm. TV. So you get a pop-up and you can click, your, click into relevant content. Um, that's still big, and I think, but I think France is even big, bigger on doing, on utilizing that. When they have events like Roland Garros, tennis is very big in France, and then they, there they have about, uh, I think it's 27 million households. So it's, uh, it's a decent size, and 80% of the TVs being sold now have this HPB TV functionality installed. Uh, in Germany, it's uh, bigger because they have more time uh, on the implementation of these kind of services, so they have have it now on 97% of the connected devices. And are most of the services advertising supported or how, how are they, um, yeah. you know, what are the uh, models? Uh, yeah, they do have commercials, uh, so that's the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Pro7 utilizes this uh, functionality for uh, uh, announcing uh, rebates or whatever uh, on the products that you have displayed uh, in between the programs. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of big. Um, I think ProSieben has uh, about 10 million simultaneous users hmm. uh, on HPB TV. Uh, and it's also spread into Austria because they also receive ProSieben. So, uh, um, and now it's, now it's actually more and more becoming a world standard. Uh, as you can see from the map, uh, Australia has already launched services as pretty recently though. Uh, it's called uh, Freeview Plus. Uh, I don't know how big it is. I think it's nine million households. Yeah. Australia is a big country, but it's not that many people. <laughs> and uh, Malaysia has taken our standard, or the, the one that we developed in Norway, uh, and uh, well, it's in Nordic region, uh, and they have adopted it to their region. Uh, Thailand is doing the same. And uh, you see Russia, they, they are also copying our spec, actually. <laughs> it's okay by us, uh, for us. It's, it's an open spec, so it's, it's nice to see it's being used. China is doing the same, of course. <laughs> For Roku, is, uh, is HPP TV something that um, provides resistance to Roku and in coming into European markets not, at all? Not at all. In fact, we were in Europe recently, and we were pleasantly surprised to see there's a lot of awareness in that market. I mean, considering uh, the game consoles like PlayStation and Apple, mm -hmm. they have quite a footprint there. But uh, I think it's still early days yeah. in streaming media players. So there's definitely room to grow. Yeah. Coming back to, to business models, um, Ryan, maybe, maybe for you, 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 you guys have built a, a, a thriving media company, essentially, on, on top of uh, you know, uh, an educational organization. Can you talk a little bit about um, advertising versus subscription and, and, and mm -hmm. what you guys have learned there? Yeah, well, I don't know that I'm the best one to talk about that because BYU TV is kind of unique this in this regard, our, we give our content for free. So if you're willing to sign in, become a by authenticated user, we're not authenticating you against a cable subscription, but we're authenticating you on a BYU TV subscription. That's free. So that just enables us to provide personalization services and track your playhead location and the videos that you're watching across, across the entire app uh, ecosystem. 
Um, but we're constantly evaluating what our options are. We do, we do run some ads. Um, we've integrated with uh, different ad platforms to deliver pre-rolls and mid-rolls to, to our apps. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think our, our biggest focus, our, our top priority is distribution at this point. We kind of view ourselves as a, as a startup. And so gaining new market, new, new uh, audience is the primary focus. And monetization will. What types of numbers have you seen with that? I'm just curious. Like, which numbers are you talking meaning, about? Meaning, like, numbers either ge geographically, how, how have you seen your, your reach spread across the globe, and or number of people watching? I'm just yeah. curious. I'm, I'm from Utah, so I, you know, I tune in and use the app a lot of so I'm just kind of curious on the kind of day when we start that, what, how have you seen that growth? Yeah, well, um, so our, our, platform, BYU TV, coincidentally, has been streaming live television for a long time. We were Move Network's uh, very first customer. So 15 plus years, we've had a live stream on the web. And uh, when I came on board four or five years ago, we were moving to a different platform. And uh, our digital platform um, rivals our TV audience, actually, in, in a lot of cases, it's bigger. And I want to harken back to a, a question you were asking before about live versus you know, streaming yeah. uh, video on demand. Um, so not only are we reinventing the channel with new content but, and building a digital platform, but we're trying to attract this new audience. And the, the, the audience that we're attracting now uh, skews very much younger. Um, or attracting millennial, a millennial audience on this digital platform. But we still have this older audience that used to watch the channel. And uh, we're bringing them along, sort of kicking and screaming. And they watch live <coughs> linear. Mm -hmm. They're buying Roku boxes. Mm -hmm. right. And they don't realize what it is, actually. They hook it up, and they'll start watching TV. And we, we realized this in our first uh, iteration of our Roku box, so, or of our Roku app. They would turn it on and somehow get that live stream going, and then about nine hours later, realize, oh, this isn't a television channel. <laughs> I'm actually streaming video here. And so they'll like turn off their TV while the Roku box is still streaming video. So we had to quickly build in some, some uh, functionality of after a, two or three hours, say, are you, are you still there? Are you really watching? Um, otherwise, we're paying for a lot of delivery that's uh, not actually. Are they still watching? Yeah, they, they actually are. And, wow. uh, you know, we have um, the live stream. <coughs> Even though every single piece of content on our channel, <coughs> you can watch it as on-demand video. It's all there. And all of the sporting events, <coughs> those live events, we also put that in a, in a section we call the DVR. So we're using an Akamai HD DVR functionality so you can pause and rewind the, the live <coughs> event, the football game, basketball game, or whatever. And the live stream is just linear. You can't really rewind that much more than about nine minutes. But the live stream is still the single most popular piece of content because they, people like to lean back and just let it come in. And so about 25 to 30 percent of all video plays are on that live linear stream, even though you can go and watch almost anything. Now, there's a few exceptions to that. We do license some content, you know, old Disney movies and things like that that uh, aren't available as on demand. But yeah. That's not what's driving the, the, live, um, the live adoption. So to answer your question, you know, uh, we've gone from basically nothing to tens of millions of, of views. And um, the audience, you know, it really is the story behind what we're doing, actually. And so when we, when we think about uh, bu building out our app ecosystem, it's a, it is about accessibility, not the same uh, criteria that you would use for building your first two apps are not the same criteria that you'll use to build your, your seventh and eighth app because you know, you're, you're, you're trying to attract. You'll spend, you can spend uh, you know, 20 percent of your effort and resources to get 80 percent of the market with three or four apps. And then you'll <coughs> spend 80 percent of your time and resource chasing that last 20 percent of your potential audience. And you've got a, what constitutes that 80%? Oh, man. Anything dealing with 
a game console. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll, we'll give you a, a little bit of heartburn. Heartburn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because, you know, Microsoft uh, and, and Sony, for that matter, I came from the video game world, so I can speak with a little bit of authority in this regard. Uh, they weren't, those platforms are not like Android and iOS, you know, open platforms, or Roku, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Very easy to publish, you know, content and apps to, to Roku. Um, very open, user-friendly, simple, quick. Uh, that's not those platforms. Yeah. And so that increases the cost and well, Let's complexity. talk about development then. You know, really the, the, whole, the whole table, maybe get everybody's perspective in developing across uh, different platforms. And certainly um, we have the, we'll be able to get the Roku perspective directly. Um, but would you recommend as a whole developing um, using standards, developing um, using uh, SDKs, existing um, uh, example reference applications, or going really deep and, and building something very custom for, for the target platforms? You know, we always recommend to our content partners, if you're starting out and you're looking at the landscape and where to develop, I, I was joking, but at the same time, it, it's true, most of our partners are choosing Roku first uh, after desktop, iOS, even sometimes before going to mobile. Um, and the reason is, you know, while we have our own proprietary language, our BrightScript-based SDK, it's very, it was very much designed with, with the 10-foot experience in mind. So we're not looking at a lot of the channels and partners that look at a, a very much an online experience and just want to take that and mimic it on TV. Um, the SDK was designed to really create this experience for the living room. Um, and, and it's very simple. You, you may have looked into it, and actually you guys probably developed a, a channel for us. Um, it's simple to use. It, uh, the whole development process cycle takes about two to three months from the time you have all the technical requirements, your backend, CDN, CMS, analytics, ad server. And we have quite a, a quick um, turnaround in our certification process, about two to three weeks uh, compared to Xbox 90 days. Um, and so we really want to make sure we provide as much resources as possible for our partners to get up and going. Now, do you need a custom SDK? N not necessarily, not in the first version. Um, we don't necessarily want to make it difficult for our partners to get on the platform. You don't need to spend 50,000. You could spend in the lower end of that about you know, 10, 15K and get your first app out the door. Um, we also have a lot of developers in our ecosystem that provide uh, an opportunity for you to get your channel launched without any upfront fees. They may take a cut of your advertising uh, inventory, for example. So it, I think it's about using a sim simplistic approach in V1 and then learn as you go, as, as our partners ha have done and made some adjustments. Um, for example, we recommend continuous play. A lot of the, the first versions of these apps were have, they had these clips, and you would watch, uh, watch a five, 10 minute clip, and then you'd have to go back and find another one. Well, if you're selling ads, which 60% of our uh, content partners are actually ad supported, mm -hmm. AVOD, if you're selling ads, you wanna drive ad impressions. So you wanna have that continuous playback, and it loads right into the next uh, content piece uh, based on relevant views on algorithms. So there are cert certain tweaks that we recommend our partners, and there's definitely a uh, playbook that we have. It's not published, but happy to share that with, with you guys. Um, we have sort of a best practices uh, playbook for partners to, to go by and look at the design and UI templates. And we also have a custom UI, so template, if, you, if that's something that you guys are interested in and pa as partners, absolutely, we uh, provide that to you. Our Roku case study is kind of an interesting, an interesting one because, you know, when we built our first Roku app, there weren't 10 million installs. There were maybe a few hundred thousand. And, How you know, long ago was this? This is uh, yeah, it was a, little high, a little higher than that. I can speak to that. <laughs> I, I, I was at Roku when the SDK was first published, and the first three, 13 apps were like Pandora and Revision 3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. BYU came a little bit later, but I think it was more than 100,000. A, a few. <laughs> it was on the order of hundreds of thousands, not tens of millions. That's right? true. That's true. But so our decision to do it wasn't based on um, you know this existing market. 
It was based on this idea that, hey, we can take a little bit of a gamble here with this company, <coughs> and we could afford to do it because the development was so easy and inexpensive. Uh, I'll share this number. Honestly, it, we, we spent $1,000 on our first app. Now, we had a developed API, so we could hand over a very well-developed mm -hmm. API to a developer who had a bit of an existing framework, mm -hmm. and he just dropped our content into his existing framework, and wow. in, a, in a couple of weeks, we had an app that was running beautifully. And, uh, you know, wow. so right. that that's, has that's, been that's a benefit tweet, to that's us. That's tweet-worthy, people. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a huge benefit to us, and now we've got an install base of about almost 350,000 Roku um, installs, and they are our most voracious consumers <laughs> of, of video. R Roku accounts for um, anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of all of our video views because it's such a great lean back experience and um, <laughs> the HLS streaming that we do there is, is as good as any, any platform that we have. That's great. Brian, you, you have an interesting perspective in your different stops in your career, yeah. combined with Sling's kind of uh, multifaceted business. You're a publisher on platforms, right. yet you're a distributor of programming in some ways as well. When you look at that landscape and, and look at cost and, and return on investment for addressing different platforms and how deep you go, like uh, how, how, do you, how do you analyze that and measure it internally? Well, I mean, there are certain, obviously, platforms that are, are given, you know, especially on the mobile side, as, especially as 4G cellular on devices, and obviously Wi-Fi has become more ubiquitous. I mean, when Sling first came out, it was a, a PC app, and, it was, and there was a Windows Phone app, I think, that was uh, a published, and it was very grainy. And, but it was just amazing that you could see video on your, sm on your smartphone. And now it's, you know, consumers are expecting bright, obviously bright displays, uh, HD quality resolution, um, and really great interactivity. And so I think that, that we've, we've tend to focus more on the mobile app development, um, meaning that, that we really want to make those apps really shine um, and, and, and really lend our, our customers uh, very favorable you know, impressions of it, um, taking advantage of, of touch displays, taking advantage of the fact that the landscape is changing um, for apps as well. One of the things that, that for the longest time Sling uh, uh, made you do was actually you had to configure your Slingbox using a PC or a Mac. <laughs> with our web-based um, yeah. software. And we got tons of feedback from customers saying, you know what, look, I, I don't use a PC or Mac anymore. I use a tablet, I use a smartphone. Why are you making me pull the, you know, the, the old PC out of the closet to configure the sling box just to put it back away again? Um, so in our most recent sling box model that we launched this summer, uh, we introduced mobile configuration, both in the iOS uh, and the phone app, um, the iOS tablet app and the Android tablet app. And so I think that was an important component. The other aspect is, is you know, going back to what I referenced earlier, which was being able to you know, send the content up to the TV pretty easily and seamlessly. We actually, um, you know, we look at Apple, we look at uh, Roku, and we look at uh, Chromecast as, as kind of those, those really big three standalone devices, obviously the gaming consoles are a huge opportunity and a huge challenge at the same time, as, uh, as Ryan pointed out, in terms of developing. But um, we actually drive all the, um, the, uh, the navigation from the mobile devices. So the software on, on your phone or on your tablet actually starts the video stream, and then we shoot it up there, and we use the phone to actually you know, look up a channel, to change the channel to, to pull up your DVR, um, we find actually in, in that implementation, the phone actually has a remote control and as a navigation mm -hmm. device is, is very, very powerful. That's so, great. That's, I mean, I think those are, those are all kind of uh, components that we, we look at in, in all this. And, um, and you know, I think that, that at the end of the day, the, the consumer is always going to be, well, why don't you support this or why don't you support that? Um, and 
And that's the next on the list. <laughs> Is there anything new people are asking for? Um, uh, uh, they're asking for Fire TV, mm -hmm. uh, Fire Stick. They're asking for Xbox One and PS4 support. They're asking for... Um, Fire Stick hasn't even shipped yet. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, I guess today, right? Oh, was it, oh, is it today? Today, I think, okay. yeah. So, I, I mean, there's always, you know, new yeah. devices, new platforms. Great. Yeah, Eric. Uh, I think it's on to something very interesting there, actually, with uh, the possibility of launching applications from uh, from the portable devices, mm -hmm. and to have them viewed on the yeah, big does screen. Does HBB yeah. TV have a mobile device story? Yeah, if you can run the second slide. Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, Glad I asked. That's well, what we are currently working. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't mind if I do. Uh, let's see. So you guys started out as a, on Roku as the headless app, and you just cast it from the Right. Phone. Right. And then the second version was on the TV. Well, it's no, it's still it's still cast for the phone. Actually, it's still cast. But you have the option the to launch it from. No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Is this, uh, Go this back one. and look at our agreement. <laughs> yeah, the, the current. <laughs> sorry. The current services are are of course not there yet, but we are. Uh, that's the top top uh, examples there. As the German broadcasters. Uh, and they don't really have that uh, functionality implemented in the proper way. They have QR codes where they synchronize the, the second screen devices with what's on. But I think that's, that's not really working well. So uh, what we are doing uh, with HPV TV 2.0, the next version, uh, is actually uh, frame synchronizing, perfect frame synchronization between uh, streams and uh, the broadcast of the signal. Uh, and also the capacity to control, uh, to mm -hmm. trigger uh, and launch apps uh, both ways from uh, the portable device to the TV as well. And do the apps reference um, HBB standards? Or is there some sort of SDK? Like if you were to build a HBB yeah. iOS experience or Android experience? Yeah, I don't know about Android, uh, but we will have to, to get the standard working for them as well. Yeah. Um, there is a bit of a challenge though because we are also we also need to consider that as the first screen, not the second screen. Uh, right. And uh, so we are looking into DVB demodulators uh, and to be able to utilize the signaling, HVT signaling directly into the portable devices as well. But and I think yeah, as a first okay. step, it's more interesting to look at the things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what they expect, that kind of functionality. Young people especially mm -hmm. expect that kind of functionality. Yeah. And I, I think... Um, my, my sense of the room is you have a combination of technology companies and uh, broadcasters or programmers that are probably US centric. Mm -hmm. If they were looking to come into Europe to distribute content, do they need to partner with um, an existing broadcaster? Is there a means to go over the top, so to speak? Or how, how, how do they play in this ecosystem? I don't know if I should oh, be answering that I one. Get, I mean, I could take that. Sure. I mean, for us, you know, in the UK, we, we actually have a retail presence, but we've also partnered with Sky mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, in launching a um, white label player, it's called Now TV, and it actually does really well, retails for 10 pounds in the market. Mm. We're working with a lot of MVPDs actually. Uh, we're very friendly with MVPDs. Um, and we will be hearing announcements in the next few months okay. of others. So that, that's one way to go about it because uh, while we don't necessarily want to get into the, the white labeling, um, I think a lot of, uh, it, it makes more sense for us to have more of a Roku powered type um, mm. device. And so we're having these conversations now and it makes it much easier to get into that market as, as opposed to standalone service and also partnering <coughs> with broadcast and, and other type of services. Yeah, like I remember Netflix. at CES last year, there were quite a few Chinese TVs that mm -hmm. had Roku mm -hmm. almost as an OS built into the platform. Yes, yeah, so, so the first iteration of that was a Roku Ready device where you would have to purchase, uh, let's say, Hitachi that would enable you to, whether it was bundled within the box or you purchase it separately, the, the stick. So that was mm -hmm. our first version, but it would be connected to the MHL port. Um, the next version was the Roku streaming stick, which we launched earlier this year, and it's huge, hugely successful. It's one of our best sellers. Um, so we just launched Roku TVs in the market in August, which is 
a, um, the, basically taking the Roku operating system embedded within the TVs, the TCL mm -hmm. and Hisense were the, the first two. We're going to have some other brand names we're going to be announcing in the next few months. Actually, at CES, we'll be announcing them. So, uh, it, and already it's gone off to rave reviews. In fact, I just read something about our Hisense TV being one of the top smart TVs, the 40 inch. Mm -hmm. And again, we're keeping it low cost because we want to drive high value. And uh, the three tenants we go by at Roku is simplicity, uh, value, and breadth of content, having over 1,800 channels uh, on Roku. So um, we actually, one of my favorite quotes that was wired that said the, the first smart TV worth buying, or the first smart TV that's actually smart. Um, because <laughs> you look at the connectivity rates on smart TVs, yeah. and people go and purchase the Samsung and LG, and it's really, the, the smart TV component is an afterthought. Yeah. You know, you're not really, you're getting it more for the display and it's got great LED and display settings, but you're not connecting it. Really, on average, it's 50 to 60%. We are anticipating more of a 60, 70% connected uh, connectivity. And when you launch the, the TV, when you go on the main UI, you'll see that the, fir the same Shoji screen that you'll see on your Roku player. It's exactly the same. At the very top, it'll have three inputs. Um, and whatever the, actually multiple in inputs, whatever the inputs are, typically it's cable over the top, gaming, console. And um, so it's, it's very much an integrated service as opposed to ha being more of an afterthought. Great. Um, one, one last question, and I think we're gonna try to get some questions from the audience, and I have a few more if, 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 if the audience uh, isn't ready. But, um, and, and this, this could be for everybody, uh, just as citizens of the industry, let's say, and what, what you hear and, and what you know, but um, MVPD authenticated content, advertising, subscription, are there certain types of content that work better on different platforms? If I am a, um, a new ski ball network and I'm looking to, to launch something, or I'm a new spin-off of uh, BET that has traditional distribution and needs authentication, where do I start? What do I look at first? Roku. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <But> we... <laughs> our experience has been that, uh, of course, shorter format content, short form uh, for mobile, okay. higher consumption. Uh, iOS is kind of unique that way. If people pair, have a, an iOS mobile device with an Apple TV and they're able to use AirPlay, some, some video apps are AirPlay enabled mm -hmm. and some aren't. Ours is, so you can quickly throw it up to the Apple TV and, and get that experience. Um, Roku and any kind of a streaming, streaming console, streaming box, to me, long format yeah. content, and that's a great experience. So that's you great. Can play it both ways. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, for hybrid, it's pretty obvious. Uh, it's, it's the relevant content <laughs> to what you're actually watching right now. So one of the services that was very popular in France, and the reason why uh, I think uh, the launch was so successful, uh, is uh, something they call Salto, where you basically where you come into a program and you're a little bit late, to be a news program, for example, and you just want to see it from the beginning. Mm. And you push one button, and then you're back from the start. Mm. And you don't really notice whether you get it broadband or broadcast. It doesn't really matter to the viewer, as long as you, you can see it from the start. So Eric, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, not knowing that much about the hybrid TV standard, mm -hmm. is, is, the, is the functionality built into the stream itself? Basically, you can think of it almost like a server-side paradigm as opposed to a client-side paradigm. Mm -hmm. So you can take mm -hmm. old flat-screen TVs that are not smart TVs and turn them into hybrid yeah, it depends on how smart they are, <laughs> because they need some uh, basic functionality. They need to have, uh, you know, a web browser. So, are you uh, creating apps then? I mean, what's the difference then between a hybrid and a smart? Yeah, the, this, the smart thing about hybrid, I would say, uh, is that you utilize the standards that's already there, uh, DVB and V3C for for web, uh, and you just put them together, and you don't have to develop several apps to adapt all these kind of. Uh, portals that's available gotcha. on Samsung, mm -hmm. uh, Sony, yeah. and stuff like that. They are already, the standard is already implemented. On it's sort of like saying in the US market, yeah. we're not going to build smart TV apps, we're going to build HTML5 yeah. web apps that's and let idea. the smart TVs consume those. Yeah, and that's a way cheaper way to develop yeah. things as well. Yeah. Then you, you develop one app and it should work on all TVs. Mm -hmm. Something that's always struck me as unique about the European approach 
is the focus on kind of catch up TV and recently watched TV. Even you know the original iPlayer UIs and the UView UIs in the UK were very focused on um, a TV grid yeah. and catching up on what has just been on. And the US centric approach has been um, less grid centric. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any change coming or is, is just any observations along those lines? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what will happen in Australia. Yeah. They, they, they are the best example of finding related EPG mm -hmm. uh, connections. And I see. It's uh, contextual. I, I, the only thing I'd add to this is a point that, that um, Eric made was about, about you know, we call it in-band, which is basically you know, an app that's, that's smart enough to basically pull from linear, live linear, DVR, uh, VOD, or OTT, and that the consumer, and, and this kind of goes back to my larger point about Sling, and, and I think that we, you know, we talk about apps and ecosystems and those types of things. At the end of the day, either the consumer is, is not um, up to speed enough or not patient enough um, to actually know where certain things reside. Yeah. And like, okay, so my subscription here will get me this, but what, it won't get me this. Mm -hmm. um, or I've authenticated for the Watch ESPN app, but you know what, I'm not actually here in the United States, I can't watch it. And so I think what we focus on a lot is being able to basically build our apps, um, and we do this with a, uh, the app that we build for the Hopper, for Dish customers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, the, the consumer doesn't even know where the content's really coming from. You know, it's all very visual, but then they hit a button and, and boom, it it's, might be coming from an over-the-top uh, service, it might be coming from uh, the VOD um, network that Dish has, it might be coming from Live Linear. And I think that there's some other things that we're doing actually on one of our products that, I, that actually has a video uh, output to the TV, which is a first for a sling box um, that uh, is actually trying to meld linear with uh, over the top so that you can have that, that contextual type of experience. I'd also like to see internet mixed in with that, um, and that's, YouTube, and that's, Facebook. Yes, and so yeah. we'll have some news in the next... Um, Several days actually addresses a number of those types types of things as well. Great, yeah. great. Let's let's pause. There's a lot more to talk about, but you know, open for questions in the back. So question was, I have to do it for the audio. Oh, sure. Question was, um, was about uh, cost of maintenance, ongoing support of an app once it's been built, about OS changes, perhaps breaking or requiring updates to the application. Question was for Ziba. You know, I, that, I, we have not heard that uh, very often. In fact, you know, we, we haven't updated our SDK in, in a while. Um, so it's been very, very same SDK. Um, updates are something that, that happen quite often. I think maybe the maybe what you've been hearing is where they have to update across the board on iOS and other devices and they use HTML, then they have to put another cost on Roku because we don't run on those languages. So that may be the issue, but um, but we pretty much, we, we don't uh, require them to, to update uh, on our end. So are, are all of the original apps kind of uh, future-proofed and compatible with the current? current uh, they are. In, in some cases, when you update, they may not play on our legacy devices. Got it. Um, and it's because we're phasing out some of our legacy devices, so we're not providing support. And that could be another uh, reason. But the old but, apps are forward compatible to yes, the new devices. Yes, absolutely. Great. Yes. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, so you talked a bit about advertising. Um, now, on the web, if you uh, have like a below the bowl autoplay ad, the CPMs for that are way, 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 way lower. I'm intrigued by um, the situation you described, Brian, where people put the stream on and it's on constant play and then mm -hmm. they just stop watching it. Presumably the ads are still running, but they're not being viewed. What, how do the sort of accreditation bodies view that kind of thing? And, 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 so the question was um, advertising um, on devices and um, how they're measured if the advertising is potentially not seen, 
particularly in an autoplay sort of situation. Um, and on the web, the, uh, the numbers are lower for bo below the fold unseen ads. Um, that was for Ryan or Brian? Brian. Uh, Brian and okay. Well, implicit in your question is the assumption that those ads are being served like server side. Right. So you're getting multiple uh, ads going in a X hour period of viewing. And that may or may not be a good assumption. Um, in our case, it's a bad assumption because the only ad that is being served from, a, from an ad server is the pre-roll. And then you're just jumping into our live stream. So you're getting whatever the network is. And those, whether or not uh, our underwriting department is selling those impressions or not is a, is a different discussion altogether. Now, eventually, in the ideal world, you, you wouldn't have this messy crossover between the television advertising world and the digital advertising world, but we do right now, and that's an issue that we can resolve with you know server-side ad stitching. Mm -hmm. And um, so, am I answering your question? I think in your use case, yes. I guess what you don't have a TV broadcast, but you're having this sort of virtual TV experience. So you're only you know, you're working only. Maybe the Vivo example? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do, uh, for, for our platform, it does get counted towards total ad impressions. And um, the standard is a pre-roll. And in a continuous play, if you, if you do it right, you have an ad, you know, less frequent ad breaks, but more ads. So you'll have, like, maybe two or three 15-second ads um, with less frequent ad. Like, a crack, crackle... Uh, Condé Nast and Vivo are three that, that we recommend look at as examples on our platform. They do it really well in terms of ad loads. And those impressions do get counted towards total amount of ad What was the third one? Crackle Condé Nast. Crackle Condé Nast and, and Vivo. And Vivo. Stuart, and, the question you're asking, though, is really one of user behavior. And does the device know when the television is on or not? If the device knows that the television has been turned off, then it can you know, power down or go to its home state. If it doesn't know, then you're really relying on user behavior. And I think over time that, that in our case, we observe that behavior probably because you got an older audience that's watching, that is just kind of lost track of the fact that this is a streaming media player, streaming, it's or, not television. Or it's kids watching like or it's every kids. single they just, episode They just flip of, off uh, the power on the yeah. television and, and, and yeah. think that it's, it's over. Well, in our case, it doesn't go to sleep, as you know, right. until, it, unless you get out of that continuous yeah, streaming. Yeah, autoplay. You know. The, the <laughs> scourge of parents I see, I see the Netflix you know, the thing on my TV every once in a while. Uh, are you still watching? This? I used to it's watch like, it. oh God, unfortunately, my kids are still watching Wild Kratts. Yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, our, Jake of the Neverland Pirates. But eventually, users will figure out that, hey, I, d I don't want the Roku streaming when I'm not actually watching it because it's sucking up bandwidth that I need for this, these other devices or, you know, in a, in a broad. But one thing I'm hearing is if, if the ads aren't viewed, there's no sort of accreditation which, you know, prevents that from being yeah, there's that impression. There's right, a, exactly. exactly. There, we, in fact, there was a recent uh, freewheel just re sent out a study recently that showed total ad impressions on over-the-top devices, and it's, it's increasing compared to broadcasts and digital uh, and online. And Roku is actually has the highest share uh, compared to even gaming consoles of total ad impressions across all our channels. Yeah, I don't dispute that. That's yeah. great. That's great. I was just wondering there, whether the viewability yeah, there's, there's a, I think, with the inconsistencies with measurement yeah. going on, yeah. as well as perceived value that brand marketers are getting from different platforms, there's a day of reckoning coming yes. soon for traditional TV, for sure. Um, and, um, and clearly there's, there's opportunity for technology providers here to, to fix yeah. and, and solve these problems. Uh, other questions? Yes. <laughs> that would be cool if they knew you were. Wait, can we repeat that? Can we repeat that? Con no, we yeah. will that. Let me repeat that. Posterity. Let's, let's, let's redact that. So, Brian, I think um, I was, when you mentioned about Dish, because I had, so what I learned today is that Sling is basically white labeled by Dish. Yeah. 
Okay. Right. So one of the things, yeah. So one of the uh, things I, I wanted to mention, and, and thank you for bringing that up, is actually we um, we make the apps uh, for the the, the dish uh, anywhere service. The Sling technology, uh, the Slingbox basic technology is built into the Hopper DVR, and then we actually have an SDK that we make available to um, pay TV providers to basically build our apps. It just so happens with Dish, that's a sister company. I mean, you know, Sling is, is, a, is a subsidiary of EchoStar. EchoStar sells the hopper to Dish, and therefore, obviously, the SDK is then used by Sling to build the Dish Anywhere apps for Dish. Now, um, we also have agreements with um, Aris, who's a, a, a cable uh, uh, equipment manufacturer, and so those, uh, so their partners actually can use the SDK to build uh, versions of our player software for iOS, Android, et cetera. Yeah. Actually, Question. HPB TV. One. Question was timeline for HPB TV coming into the US. Yeah, the 1.5 version uh, could be ready already. I know it's not deployed, uh, or I think it's not deployed. ATSC 2.0. You probably know more about this than I do. Uh, ATSC uh, 3.0, uh, that will include HPB TV 2.0. It's more of a revolutionary uh, development. And I know there are other parts there that will take some time. Uh, so. Uh, when you deploy um, ATSC 2 uh, on terrestrial services, you will be able to utilize what's inside now. So, and that means every dash. Ultimately, that's to be deployed by an, an operator, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can do the same in cable as well. Uh, I mean, it's it's so easy to reference mm -hmm. this uh, standard, uh, and it's already based on existing standards. So <laughs> it's really nothing new. It doesn't require any new hardware. Uh, it's basically web uh, services uh, that's tailored for TV. Great. Let's do yeah. one more question. Yes. Yeah, um, Jerry with uh, Novax. A uh, question with you to um, Viva. Um, specifically, uh, Roku, when it first started, was a video on demand, primarily um, you know, uh, service, and then eventually live streaming. Is there a preference from viewers? Is there a preference for viewers for live and linear? So there's this, you know, um, you know, internet broadcasting perspective. Everyone thinks that Roku is kind of a you know, video on demand and Netflix, but mm -hmm. there's this boom to perspective that people like. You know, this, this, uh, I'm curious, has that, you know, this could be for, um, for Ryan as well. You know, do you see uh, a preference Last for live linear versus so last question was um, preference by viewers on the, the platforms for live linear versus uh, VOD content. I think it, it's an interesting question. I, I, I believe it's also based on what's available right now. The majority of the content is, as you said, on demand. But we do have like a Time Warner cable, for example. It's uh, it's an authenticated service that has both like 300 channels, live linear, and then on demand. And that it's got, it's one of our top channels. Um, it is authenticated, so it's not available to everybody. But where it is, it's pretty popular. And we also have like Watch ESPN, um, another authenticated channel. We have the CBS News channel I was referring to earlier that dumps the, the viewer right into the live linear feed. So I, I think it's a mix. Um, in terms of usage, when we look at our numbers, it's still, the highest is still on demand. But I think it's, that's more a result of the fact that we don't have a lot of the live linear yet. If we did, I do think it would be more mixed. And there is definitely <coughs> an argument to be made because people still, by and large, as Ryan was mentioning, like that lean back experience. So we, we always recommend for our, our content partners, when they're looking at developing 
to have a component of each if it makes sense for your content to have that. Um, and it's, I don't think it's limited, you were talking about earlier, to sports. It's uh, very much, there's like, for example, cooking channels. One could argue you could go midstream to watching a cooking channel or HGTV, that very popular house hunters, let's say, and you'll just get in midstream and start watching it. So there, it isn't just limited to the traditional live appointment viewing. So that there's still very much a demand for that. Great. So thank you. Uh, follow everybody on Twitter, post away. Hope you uh, enjoyed the discussion. A little applause for the great panelists. Thank you.